Welcome everyone to our uh, sixth session of our six month biocontrol uh, technical workshop series. I've already done a bit of an introduc introduction to many of you. Uh, we had just had a few technical difficulties at the start with the uh, sharing of the slides, but it looks like it's all fixed now. And, and thank you for Roma and Patti for uh, working that out. Um, it's wonderful to be here again. Uh, I'm going to move quite quickly to make up a bit of time. Um, so I'm gonna move to the next slide. And this is just how to use the system today. Uh, you all probably know how to do this. We've had lots of experience throughout the last uh, six months. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please just try logging off and on. Actually, it's probably the best idea. Or go down to the mute. And if you press the little arrow there, you'll see uh, system settings. And you can click onto that. And you can actually look at what... Uh, what uh, your sound system is and also your video selection there. So that will sort out other problems. Uh, if you would like to um, ask a question today and we really encourage that, please write them in the Q&A like, like normal. Um, it's really helpful for us to have them all in one place. Uh, please use chat though to talk to the group, to share your resources. If you're working on something and you want to tell us uh, what you're looking at in biopesticides and, and your experience of trials, please share that with us in the chat. We love to have that. Uh, and also you can rename yourself if you would like, uh, just by pressing the more button, uh, if you uh, slide over your participant uh, name there. Now I have a bit of a thunderstorm in the background, so hopefully that, that won't be too loud. If we move on to the next slide, And this is just a reminder that this is part of a six month uh, workshop series. We've actually uh, developed this with a number of different organizations across the world. We're very interested in your feedback and we now have a website, a portal there for you to communicate with us. And that's at the ASEANFAWaction.org. So please visit that. If you wish to have a certificate of participation, and I know many of you ask me, um, you must subscribe to the Biocontrol Forum on that website. And you have to either ask a question, share something interesting about yourself or note something useful in the biocontrol series and on the next page I'm going to show you just how to do that it's very very simple And you'll see here, you go to the website, ASEANFAWaction.org. You then will check on the community uh, link there on the menu, and then you'll click on forum. You'll go to the forum, and you'll see at number three there, a picture that says the biocontrol uh, for FAW. And you'll click on that, and it'll ask you uh, to probably subscribe. It's very quick and simple. And then you can put in your details, questions, share your research. Sorry. On the, no, that's okay. Actually, that's great, Roma. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to remind you that our next session will be around design tips for conservation biocontrol studies and programs. Uh, and then we will also be coming back later in June for another biopesticide efficacy part three. We will be looking at uh, ASEAN-based researchers and their experiences with biopesticide trials. Okay, next slide. Sorry, it didn't That's work. okay. Nothing's happening. If you just press, you might have to press it twice, Roma, maybe. I've done that. I've done that. It's just still not working. Can you press your down button? I did that. It's still not working. <laughs> That's okay. What we could do is we can just, nothing's working. I'll try again. Oh, there ah, there we go. So I'm going to, um, sometimes it does get a bit stuck. So so don't panic. Um, Roman's probably a bit stressed at the moment because she is going to be presenting soon and she's also moving the slides, um, but she's doing a wonderful job. So we actually have her up first, but just to say for this session, there will be some polls. There'll be lots of question time and there'll be some really good presentations. I'm really looking forward to them. Like usual, our experts have really outdone themselves and I've had a sneak preview of course uh, and there's some really interesting experiences and learnings to share so I think first up Roma you're going to give us an introduction sort of following on from your session last time just to remind us why we're all here and I'd just like to say thank you very much your session last time was wonderful I had such a, uh, such a, a huge amount of great feedback about it so um, please 
relax, chill out. Don't worry if things don't go right with the slides again. I can always load up another another set of slides. So thank you, Alison. Can I just Welcome. confirm? Can you see? Are you seeing any of the Zoom operation pages, or are you just seeing? No, the I'm just seeing the slides at the moment. It's looking good. good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alison. Um, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody who's here, and thank you for joining us again. Um, what I first wanted to do was just go through a little bit of a recap on what we talked about last time, but also I want to draw something slightly different out of it. So just first of all, just a reminder of the, the technologies that we're talking about when I'm talking about biopesticides. There's four groups. We've got the macroorganisms, which are natural enemies, microorganisms, botanicals and semiochemicals. Um, what I really want to emphasize and to, to sort of have us thinking about is that these bioprotectants, they have multiple modes of action on the targets and in interaction with the plant. And this makes it more complicated for doing trials. Um, and so what we had looked at last time was what actually happens when we run efficacy trials. And what we could see that if you look at this graph where it's the the results and the variability that you get in a trial series, we can see that we get quite a wide data scatter. Um, and the questions we've got is how do we manage that? What do we do about the, that wide data scatter? And the data scatter is so wide because you have the variability in your plant, you have the variability in your active substance, and then we have the human variability. And what we're trying to sort out today is that we can reduce the human variability that we put in the trials um, and see if we can stabilize things a little bit. And what, does this, what happens when you, you do trials and you're not managing variability is you end up with data that looks like this. Um, it's which if you look at the, you've got efficacy against the number of pests and looking at the pest population, you have a wide scatter of data, but also this type of, um, and looking at the data in this way also sort of gives us an indication that I often hear people saying, oh, the product didn't work because the pest population was too high. And when you look at a graph like that, you think actually that's not a true statement. Um, what the, what's important is the rate of the population growth, not the size of the population. You need to sort of just change the thinking it, it, a little bit on that. And then if we think about the variance again, um, what does this look like when we have, have high levels of variance? So if we look at a product that's doing well and we're getting sort of a good average efficacy of sitting at 70, 80%, but we have a variance, which is around about 15, 60%, what it means is this is what our data will look like. We will have data points sitting within this margin. So it's that slight complication is the better a product performs, the wider the data scatter. And that makes it much harder for us to work with it. And so what I want to try and go through a little bit today is saying, how can we reduce that data scatter? How can we design our trials to reduce that noise so that we can see really what's happening with our product and how our products are performing? So when we're working with biological systems, the biopesticides, they multiply the variance in the system. And it's it's the variance is the outcome. It's, it's the multiplication of the natural variance in the target population and the plant and the biopesticide population. This is why we have a wide data scatter. So if we can hold that in mind as to say, it, we, it will always be variable. It will always have that effect of the biology. We can, and we can't change that in many ways. We want to harness that. So the trick is how do we do trials and manage that. And that's what I'll sort of go on to in detail shortly. So first of all, I wanted just to see if we're all awake a little bit and just have a little bit of think and just to understand who who's in the audience today. So Alison's going to put up a poll now, if you could answer this. Great, and you should be able to see that I can see people voting already, Roma. So there's yes. three questions there, everyone. Oh, and voting's happening quite quickly. So we've got <laughs> 190 people online at the moment. So that's fantastic. And from all around the world, I see uh, all sorts of places. It's great. So, uh, so who, we've got nine, 102 people have voted so far. So I'll, I'll give a bit more time. Okay. Because we've still got quite a few coming on once they sort of slow down. Maybe now I'm going to 
end polling and share results. Can you see those results? Oh, so we have got, I'd say 50% of the audience has been doing trials with all the technologies and that, which is really interesting. Fantastic. What, what probably is, it may be that the, it's not the same 50% have done trials on all three. So I'm guessing that different people have done different trials on different technologies. Um, but that's good to know. So this is something that um, we've all seen the data, we've all seen what the data looks like and, and you know, we all have to struggle with trying to understand the data. Thanks, thanks, Alison. So we should have lots of questions, I think, probably in lots of experiences there to share. <laughs> Thinking of, yeah. that's quite a high number. I'm, I'm impressed with that 50%. Yeah, yeah. And are there any urgent questions right now, Alison, that we, we should answer? Uh, no, not now. I think I think we could carry on. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Good. Okay, so we'll go on. I am trying to move on, don't worry. Just a few glitches. <laughs> There we are. Right. Um, so what's going to happen now is um, when we're doing this work, we're not talking about the, the, the macroorganisms and I will talk about microorganisms and botanicals in a short while. But what I'd like to do now is to hand over the presentation to Party, um, who is going to talk about semi chemicals and pheromones. Party, if you'd like to pick up from here. Great. And you're okay, Party. I'll just give you a quick introduction. Uh, Party is the Director of Field Development at ProVivi and has over 20 years of experience in the crop protection industry and research sector. Uh, and he did develop this uh, presentation with Chris Wheeler. So a big thanks to Chris, who I know is in, I think, um, maybe San Francisco or somewhere in California. Uh, so it's a little bit early in the morning for him. But thank you to both of you. Party, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And um, today, um, thanks for the opportunity for uh, for speaking about mating disruption, which is a, a new technology for most of us in Asia. Uh, mating disruption is not uh, is not new for the world, but it is very new for uh, developing countries, especially for broad acre crops for uh, like rice and corn. So today I'm going to share with you the lessons that we have learned uh, conducting trials in Asia Pacific, uh, especially on rice and corn. Uh, many of the examples that I'm going to take are from, uh, from corn uh, that we have done uh, trials in Asia Pacific, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, next slide, please. So let me give a quick introduction about mating disruption. I remember giving a talk on mating disruption or sexual confusion a couple of months ago, but uh, what is mating disruption or what we call a sexual confusion? This is uh, usually done with uh, insect synthetic sex pheromones. Uh, those sex pheromones are naturally occurring sex pheromones where female will give out sex pheromones that uh, olfactory senses will be received by the males uh, to get attracted to and copulate. And then, um, and then female will produce eggs, viable eggs that will produce larvae. And the larvae will feed on the plants and then go to pupate and the next generation would occur. So where we intervene with mating disruption is in, during the starting of the cycle. So the principle behind mating disruption is saturating the whole environment with pheromones. Okay, so that the natural pheromone that is released by the females is camouflaged and the males will not find the females. Even with a weaker signal, you know, it's uh, in the huge pheromone cloud, the females will not mate and the benefits of mating disruption are seen. So I'll talk about benefits of mating disruption in the next few slides. So the whole uh, technology sounds very simple, but uh, there are lots of things that goes on in the background. For example, uh, we know that natural sex pheromone or synthetic versus synthetic blend uh, could be very, very similar. For example, we are mimicking the naturally occurring sex pheromone by synthetically manufacturing them. So when we are doing that, we want to be as close as to the uh, natural sex pheromone, but there are several things that could uh, go wrong. The natural is natural and synthetic is synthetic. So the first thing that we do in the discovery science program of characterization is to understand the natural occurring blend as compared to the synthetic blends that we make. So we call these as blend optimization because 
The natural sex pheromone does not comprise of a single active ingredient. It's a mixture of active ingredient in specific ratios. So optimizing that blend is the first step towards successful mating disruption program. So it is done both in laboratory as well as field situations. On the left side, you can see that in the laboratory situations, we use electroantinograms or wind tunnels to understand how the female, how the males will respond to the synthetic female source. So you see that flight tunnel, what we call as wind tunnel or flight tunnel, where on the one side, we actually put the pheromone source and we release the males on the other side and we see the up wide, upwind uh, flight towards the pheromone source. And we also use electroantinograms to understand specific reactions in the olfactory senses. So once this is all done in the laboratory, we do the field trials. We start the field trials because once we know that uh, this, this pheromone blend is attractive enough to the naturally occurring pheromone source, we take them and put them in the traps. On the right side, you can see that bucket trap, which was usually seen in, uh, in uh, maize or corn, where we use for fall or mealworm trapping studies or monitoring, for, for example. So we put these naturally occurring, the synthetic blends of pheromone source, along with the natural blends, uh, to understand what is the difference between the natural blend and, and, the, and the synthetic blends. And then these are done in representative areas where we want to do field trials to look at the efficacy. So what we call them as trapping studies to understand uh, the attractiveness of the blend. Next slide, please. So once we have the blend, the next thing that we need to understand is where do we put this blend, right? So we all know when we think about pheromones, we all think about lures and traps, right? So even in the lures, we have the same synthetic sex pheromone, but it is in a very small little quantities. It is in milligram or picomolar quantities that is released. In the dispensers that you see on the right side, those are black things are dispensers which are um, made up of a low density polyethylene. It's like, imagine a small uh, sample sachet. <laughs> so it has an active ingredient inside and uh, the materials are very porous so that it will, it will start releasing the pheromone from the dispensers. So these are dispensing the pheromone into the air throughout the season. The formulation itself uh, is, is a very tricky part because we want to release this pheromone throughout the season for 90 days period without even changing the dispensers. So it's an uphill task. So we want to really understand in the laboratory as well as field situations, uh, how does this uh, dispenser technology actually works? And uh, from ProBB, we also have uh, formulations which are sprayable formulations, but today's uh, session, I'm gonna concentrate more, more on the point sources or the dispensers. So we really want to understand uh, what happens with these dispensers in the environmental chambers in the laboratory. We want to understand the active ingredient composition. Does it change over time? Is it intact or not? Does it degrade into components because of environmental factors, especially temperature, humidity, wind velocity? Several things can affect the, the release rates of these pheromone dispensers. And then, of course, the physical stability of these dispensers. You know, it's made up of uh, plastic, polyethylene. So it has to be intact without any delamination through the season. And as we know, you know, the corn plants grow very fast. You know, these are like 35 days old plants on the right side. You know, so the shade of the plants, the temperature according to the crop canopy, and all those things are studied very well before we actually jump into the field trials. Next slide, please. Okay. It's coming, I think. Here right. we go. So um, when we look at the, when we have the formulation, we have the blend, there are several parameters that we start looking at. So we make a list of several parameters that we need to understand the benefits of mating disruption. The first one is the moth captures. Okay, let me explain a little bit about moth captures. Why are we talking about trapping these moths when we're talking about releasing the pheromone into the cloud and creating a cloud of pheromone? 
So just imagine when you have dispensers out there in the field, uh, several dispensers standing out in the field of one hectare plot through the season, they're releasing the pheromone. So we want to put a proxy female in the field, in the middle of the field. Uh, and then this proxy female is nothing but the pheromone lure. So the pheromone lure is nothing but acting as a proxy female. So if the whole area is saturated with pheromone source, the, the, the proxy female, which is nothing but the trap, should not be found by the males. So just imagine if we have a, a trap sitting in the middle and then covered with dispensers, the cloud of this cloud of pheromone source will camouflage even the proxy female. If you don't, then you see the picture on the left side where you will catch more number of moths in no dispenser plots. So the whole understanding is we want what we call as trap shutdown. It has nothing but we want to have no moths, very negligible numbers in the pheromone dispenser installed plots or mating disruption plots. So this is the first thing, what we call as mode of action, right? So the mode of action is nothing but we want to have a cloud of pheromone. Is it, is it enough with 20 dispensers or 30 dispensers? Those are the things that we actually look at several parameters as moth captures. And also it is important also to understand that we, we try to understand number of uh, traps that are required to understand the efficacy of mating disruption. Okay. So ultimately what we want to understand is the zero moth captures in the mating disruption plots. Next slide, please. The next few parameters are very uh, general parameters, just like uh, any uh, uh, chemical insecticide evaluation or a biological insecticide evaluation. So those are the things that uh, we start looking at uh, other than moth capture parameters. Okay. I think it's coming through. Okay. So when we start looking at uh, the moth captures, we also want to look at uh, mating tables. So just imagine these uh, females are waiting for the males to, um, uh, to find them and then, uh, and then copulate, right? So we really want to understand if the females are mated or not inside the mating disruption plots. So what we do is we use a mating tables and we actually use, uh, sometimes we use sweep nets to recapture these females from the field. And it is not an easy task because most of them are nocturnal moths, right? So including the fall army worm. So we need to go a little late in the night or early in the morning to recapture these, uh, uh, these females and dissect them to understand uh, whether they have spermatophores or not, spermatophores are nothing but uh, egg sacs. So whether they have mated or not, is that's the way to find it. So we seldom use light traps also, but you know, light traps will attract not just the, the uh, fall army or moths, but it attracts, it attracts all kinds of insects. So it's a chaos over there. So we try to use mating tables and or sweep nets to capture these females and dissect them to understand uh, if they have developed spermatophores or not, trying to understand if they have mated or not. Okay. So once we do all these uh, aspects, then we look for egg loading and larval population. So the female moths, um, you know, after the after the copulation, they go around and lay eggs, as we see. It's laid in egg masses. So we, we usually go around, uh, collect the parameters of egg mass in the field and also look at the larval population, just like any larval population that we look at uh, for, you know, chemical insecticide evaluations. So the larva, the egg, egg, egg masses, though they have laid, uh, we have seen se several times that these don't hatch fully because either the female is not mated, they have to produce eggs, they lay eggs, but these are non-viable eggs. So they don't usually hatch and produce larvae. So that's a benefit of mating disruption. And we also want to understand the long-term benefits of mating disruption, where we look at the, the decrease in fecundity uh, that, de that decreases the number of generations season after season. Just imagine if there is a lesser mating happening in the field, there is a significant drop in, drop in uh, the, the larval population. So very significant levels of drop in pupil population and the moths coming for the next generation would be lower and lower. So with the regional mating disruption, 
season after season, we can probably see very negligible pest incidents. And sometimes we can even eradicate the pest um, in these situations. So these are all the several parameters and uh, you know, the other parameters include damage reduction. Um, we use, uh, we need to talk in the same language as the Davis scale. We use the Davis scale of uh, zero to nine, zero being no leaf damage at all. And then nine being the whole world or four leaves mostly destroyed. So we go and look at the, the damage reduction due to mating disruption. Lesser the incidence of pest, less is the damage. So it should directly correlate between mating disruption or lesser number of moths mating and uh, the damage reduction that we see in the, in the fields. So mating disruption uh, is, is strongly is correlated to the population density. So we have seen that in many cases where there is an outbreak of pest population, it is very difficult to, um, to do the mating disruption, to rely on mating disruption alone than compared to um, unifying other, other technologies, including chemical applications. In uh, low to medium pest population, den pest population densities, we have seen that mating disruption alone can do a good job. So we look at the damage reductions. So these are all the parameters that we'll start looking at uh, when we start doing the field trials. When we start doing the field trials, what do we compare with, right? So if there is an insecticide evaluation or a biopesticide evaluation, we can easily compare with the uh, synthetic chemistries or conventional insecticide chemistries or conventional methods of management. But mating disruption is completely different technology. Mating disruption is a prophylactic application to prevent the pest population right from the beginning. So just imagine these dispensers are put out in the field right after sowing. And then these dispensers are taken out um, during the harvest season. So they are out there in the field protecting the crop throughout the season. So it is completely different compared to insecticides, which are typically used as a curative application. So you see the larvae or the farmers see the larvae, they want to kill the larvae and then they destroy it. So uh, there is no direct comparison that will always make sense. However, we need to compare that. So we start comparing our uh, mating disruption plots uh, with synthetic chemistries uh, or conventional grower practices to make, uh, um, you know, though there is orange to apple comparisons, but we need to make a comparison because there is no other technology that we can compare it with. So this is part of uh, you know, integration of several tools as a package for IPM. We always talk about integrated pest management, but uh, at the growers level, they have very few choices. So probably mating disruption can be a choice to start looking at integrated pest management uh, as, as, a, as a toolkit to manage fall army worm and other pests. And then what we do is we start looking at uh, the first few trials and uh, what we call them as dose rate optimization. Dose rate optimization is nothing but, um, you know, if we are looking at a, a biological insecticide or, uh, or a synthetic insecticide, we talk about dose rates as number of or ml per hectare or gram EN per hectare. So the similar way we talk about dispensers per hectare. So we start looking at uh, multiple dose rates in replicated trials to understand the dose rates for reduction in moth capture. So these are done in small, small size trials. When I say small size trials for mating disruption, it can go up to 30 hectares. As the below uh, figure indicates, these are different locations. Just imagine I'm testing uh, five treatments uh, and five in five replicate plots. So the whole area of location one is a 30 hectare plot. So why we do in 30 hectare plot is um, these are, this, these pheromones are released out, the, out into the air and they're dispersed because of the wind. So smaller plots, smaller than you know, a few hectares will not be uh, good enough for us to understand the benefits of mating disruption. So we need to have a minimum hectare age to understand the benefits of mating disruption. So once we do these moth capture uh, reduction in the dose rate optimization trials, then we go for wide area trials. In the wide area trials, we choose 
um, commercially important areas, which are commercially important areas when I say are the definition where uh, corn is grown uh, uh, in, a, in a larger hectare se season after season and where fall hormone incidence is seen uh, so that we can have a higher probability of success for the field trials. For example, when we started doing trials in Indonesia, we choose East Java as one of the important locations where they grow corn at 31% uh, compared to other locations in Indonesia. So we go there and then we choose the plots, we work with the farmers, we choose plots, and then uh, get into an agreement with the farmers to do these wide area trials. So when I talk about wide area trials, these are like you know two to three dose rate of trials replicated uh, at least three to four times for their statistical significance. So a single trial location can have at least up to 60 to 70 hectares. So when I say 60 to 70 hectares, <laughs> it is easier to do this in, a, in, uh, in geographies like Brazil or Mexico, where uh, corn is grown in, uh, in a larger hectares, where the land holding of the farmer itself is 100 to 300 hectares. But when you talk about Asia Pacific region, the land holding of the farmer itself is less than 0.5 hectare. So we need to get into farmers agreements with so many different farmers, let them know what this technology is all about and what we can uh, help them understand that this is going to show a lot of benefits for managing fall army worm. So we also understand at the same time, we need to understand what, how many number of hectares is a minimum plot size that is necessary to realize the benefits from mating disruption. So these wide area trials are done at several locations to our initial, for gaining initial understanding of the dose rates before we start the registration trials for registering the product. So um, when we talk about registration, you know, it also talks about the viable product concept uh, uh, for commercialization purposes. So once these wide area trials are done, we have a lot of data with us. We need to churn the data. We need to understand what data is telling us. So when we talk about the data interpretation, um, so there are several things that come into picture. Uh, these are really large hectare plots, not a small hectare plots. So these, the statistical validation of mating disruption uh, with, for decision making would, would be very, very important. So um, since these, uh, these are really large hectares in several geographies, uh, and uh, sometimes we, um, we want to interpret the data from country to country, region to region, then we need to understand, uh, then we cannot use uh, the normal uh, traditional statistics to understand uh, the, the, um, the data. So what we use is spatial temporal um, uh, statistical analysis where we come up with uh, um, uh, that statistical models that are developed indigenously with us um, for understanding the space and time and the growth stages of the crom, corn plant as well. So uh, we use something called covariance matrix. This is all, uh, sorry for the busy slide. Um, so we use Gaussian process and probability success and general linear regressions uh, to interpret the answers by tagging each dispenser for GPS coordinates. Why we do that is, um, you know, for every dispenser, there is a pheromone cloud. The dispersion of the pheromone cloud uh, through space and time is very, very important for us to understand. And not just that, the surrounding areas in that region also has, also has corn. And uh, we know that fall army worm can, to, can fly to a longer distances. Um, so it is, so it, it's very, very important for us to understand uh, spatial temporal uh, analysis uh, to understand the data and interpret the data so that we understand what these benefits are really coming from. So traditional statistics do not really support us. So we use the spatial analysis for this. Once we get this spatial analysis done, then we start looking at the value, value creation trials for the growers. These are nothing but uh, uh, knowledge sharing sessions. Since the technology is very, very new, we need to, we need to make sure that growers understand what mating disruption technology actually provides them. So there are several ways of looking at uh, the value and the benefits for the growers. 
uh, we tell uh, you know it's we educate them in terms of proactive way of pest management, reducing and preventing the population growth in wide areas, reduces the residues because we are the the lesser number of uh, generations, the lesser the damage it is, the lesser number of insecticides that need to be applied. So there are several benefits coming out of that itself. Uh, residues are, are lower, the pollution and the health hazards uh, are lower. We increase the natural enemies in the in the whole ecological system. And it, this is non-lethal uh, to, uh, to higher mammals and non-target species. So a single treatment can be effective throughout the season. You don't have to go and change, so less laborious. So, and then consistent area-wide utilizations, farmers can come together and uh, and lessen the population in the whole area as a community farming. So we we uh, we usually do these uh, as value creation trials, show the value to the farmers because it is new technology. And then after that, we go for pre-commercialization phase. Call it as a commercialization phase, commercialization phase, but it is more of a network and stakeholders involvement uh, for new technology and knowledge knowledge sharing sessions, uh, because seeing is believing. This is a new technology. They need to see and believe um, what, and we want to showcase the technology and demonstrate value, demonstrate value to the growers so that they can adopt this technology. At the same time, um, you know, we, we, we look at uh, the viability of the concept, whether it can, uh, it can support commercialization or not. So the pictures that I'm showing here is, is from the rice uh, product that we're going to launch in Indonesia. Uh, for yellow stem borer management this October season. So when the after the pre-commercialization phase, you know it goes to the farmers and then they start uh, looking at uh, the uh, they start um, uh, adopting this technology as a tool of integrated pest management. This is my last slide. Um, uh, briefly, I would I would like to talk about the constraints of uh, of mating disruption. So as I was mentioning to you, there are several farmers who are involved in this, small holding farmers. It's always a challenge to work with individual farmers. For each trial, if it is a 60 hectare plot, we're talking about more than 200 farmers who are involved in these trials. So it requires a lot of synchronous community-wide adoption of this technology. So it gives us an opportunity to work with the farmer groups, associations, It'll be more power for the farmers to manage uh, like uh, uh, invasive pests like uh, fall on mewam more consistently. The second is uh, fall on mewam is a new pest for Asia. So farmers usually use uh, more than required insecticides, number of applications, they're scared. So it gives an opportunity to educate the farmers and then in initiate a dialogue of economic threshold levels. So as an IPM practice. Finally, you know, there are no guidelines as of now for registering mating disruption products. Though the pheromones are regarded as very safe, still we actually use insecticide guidelines. So it's an opportunity for us to network with our regulatory bodies in several countries uh, for this adoption of new technology and speed up the registration process and implementation, of course, to help the farmers. Okay, that's where I end. and. Uh, I guess I will pass on to Roma. It'll probably be me, but um, <laughs> Roma's going to come on very soon. But thank you so much, um, Patsy. That, that was extremely interesting. Um, and you covered a lot of points in that presentation uh, as well. We actually have a lot of questions coming in. So um, it's good we've got some time. Now we've got 15 minutes, actually. So that'll give us plenty of time uh, to, to ask all of those. Um, just one thing that you mentioned at the end about guidelines for pheromone products is for the regulatory process. Is that something that uh, you and other companies could work on together or do you think that would be useful to have guidelines uh, specifically for this product? Um, usually mating disruption is uh, is uh, is with uh, the pheromones that are used uh, in uh, traps. But these are um, uh, these these has to be tested for uh, for their efficacy. And um, when we talk about efficacy, uh, we talk in a similar lines of insecticides, which is which is not that which is is a completely different technology. So I think we need to have a different guidelines. How do we really evaluate the efficacy of mating disruption products? Uh, 
that's where our book protocol discussions and guidelines would come in. Okay, excellent. Okay, moving on to some of these questions. I, I have one here um, at the very start is, can we import, uh, I think, more of this technology from ProVivi to the Philippines? If yes, how? Are you looking at other areas outside Indonesia at the moment in this region, or are you sort of focused more on proving it in one place before moving to others? Um, right now, we are uh, uh, we are doing research in uh, in several countries in ASEAN, including uh, Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, so um, yeah, we can we can definitely take uh, Philippines into consideration as well. Okay, uh, I have a specific sort of more technical question here is please advise the best method to conserve females without damaging their pheromone gland. Would you be able to answer that question? Um, it doesn't affect the pheromone glands of, uh, I, I did not quite get that question. So what's that question again? No, I'm not uh, sure as well. And I've just, uh, just got rid of it, but it was more around, can you, I'll come back. To, here we go. Wait a minute. I'm going to go. Uh, please advise the best method to conserve females without damaging their pheromone gland. It doesn't affect any pheromone gland of natural females. Okay, there we go. Quick answer. Uh, why do we not focus uh, on treating host plants with semiochemicals rather than placing the dispensers in the field? Because in is the air, it's quite difficult to maintain the concentration of... I guess the pheromone is it? Yeah, yeah. So I guess you're asking why. The, yep, go. I, I think uh, I understand that question. So yep. the the pheromone, um, you know, uh, dispensers are non-crop uh, uh, applications. Uh, these are nothing but off-crop label usage. So we're not spraying anything in the on the crop. So when we spray something on the crop, uh, it will be much more uh, be effective, but at the same time, uh, we need to have multiple applications. So we need to also look at uh, the economics of the farmers uh, to look at, uh, to spray these uh, sprayable pheromones. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Brazil and Argentina, we are actually working with sprayable foundations of pheromones uh, where we actually spray them aerially. But when it comes to Asia Pacific region, small holding farmers, I think it would be much more economical to use dispenser technology. Oh, that's an interesting, um, th that's a good point. And actually on that, you, you talked about the work that you do with farmers, which I think was extremely interesting. Um, when you get farmers together to talk about this, to educate them about um, the, the technology, what are some of the sort of maybe one or two questions that spring to mind? Are there some common ones that, that come up time and time again that you hear from farmers? What, what's their first reaction? Yeah, the first question that we actually get from the farmers is, okay, so we don't have to spray insecticides, right? <laughs> so um, that's the first question. So yeah, there are many times what we have seen is we completely eliminate the number of applications of insecticides, but not all times. So insecticides are part of integrated pest management program. So we're not trying to eliminate insecticides, but we are trying to conserve these insecticide molecules for a longer time. So. Uh, the, there are very few insecticide chemistries that we have. I think it is very important both for insecticide chemistries as well as traits for us to conserve for a long time usage. So this technology will uh, will actually help uh, that lengthening the process of resistance uh, resistance monitoring. Oh, good point. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Audrey. Um, hi, fall armyworm presents a high uh, fecundity rate, which means that you could have important population outbreaks. My question is how mating disruption is working for this species if you already have a large number of females present in the field. Even if the males will be perturbed, they will still find females. How is mating disruption then efficient against fall armyworm? That's a great point. So yeah, for a fall army bomb, especially compared to other uh, noctuid moths, uh, it is a very strong flyer. So we do these, uh, when we're doing these trials, just imagine this is a small little island of uh, mating disruption trial in a big sea of corn growing all around. Uh, but when there is an adoption of regional adoption or a village adoption or sub-district adoption of mating disruption product, what we have seen is there are very less number of mated females flying into the region 
so we're not disturbing females so female fem female moths are very welcome to come and lay the eggs in the mating disruption plot right so we often see the the female moths uh, uh, which are mated outside the mating disruption plot flying into the mating disruption plot and mm -hmm. start laying eggs where we see the damage but uh, when we have our area wide adoption there will be very less number of mated females that we can actually see okay so, so it, it yeah we need to have an intervention with uh, some of the biological insecticide spray applications uh, even in the mating disruption plots especially for fall or newborn management because it is a very strong flyer and it migrates from like southern part of uh, us to all the way to canada so we can imagine that it is a very strong flyer and we have seen that in asia pacific region also within a short period of time it went all the way from india to australia Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, and onwards uh, into the Pacific yep. as well now. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of fall armyworm, how many traps is recommended per hectare or area of maize for effective mating disruption? Um, it can range uh, from, uh, you know, 30 to 40 dispensers per hectare, but at the same time, we're still finalizing those two rates uh, for Asia Pacific region. Uh, um, we have launched the product in Mexico um, by Ferogen. Uh, we recommend uh, 30 dispensers per hectare, uh, one-time application, which is one-time installation in a season uh, when actually they do the, the sowing of corn plants or sowing of corn seeds. Okay. It'll stay throughout the season. Okay. And when is, sorry, when is the best time to install the dispensers? If the area site is often windy, does that have an influence on the effectiveness of the treatment? Um, it doesn't affect the effectiveness of the treatment with temperatures, relative humidity and wind velocity and rainfall. Uh, the dispenser technology is helping us there. So it releases a pheromone cloud uh, or it releases a specific amount of pheromone uh, through the day uh, and that will last long for season. Okay. Yeah, so it is, uh, the dispensers are, um, dispensers are placed in the field right at the sowing. Just imagine uh, um, as soon as the farmers are sowing their corn, either by mechanical means or by manual means, they go on the same day, a person walking behind will actually put the dispensers for every 22 feet or 22 pace lengths. Okay. So that these are you know evenly spread throughout the plot. Okay. A question here, it says that pheromones are species, it is said that pheromones are species specific. Why are some catching other species? Do you find that? No, we don't usually find that. Okay. Uh, there are some there are some uh, pheromones that are uh, that are that are in that are within the species as well, but that is very very rare for fall army worm. Uh, you know, if we are designing a, a sex pheromone source for fall army worm, it attracts only fall army worm, nothing else. Okay, you've got lots of questions here, Patty. I just hope that you're re you're ready <laughs> afterwards because there's a lot of interest. Uh, just carrying on with some of these questions. Here's a, a question here from an anonymous attendee, but uh, the question is: Does um, could an improper setup of pheromones result in more pest instead of less pest? Um, no, this is not attracting. Uh, this is the free. This is a, one of the frequently asked questions by the farmers so when we think about pheromones. Uh, these are attractants, right? So they think that uh, these pheromones are attracting the pests from everywhere, you know, from the adjacent, uh, adjacent fields or neighbor's plots. Oh, when I put these dispensers, probably I'm attracting more of the more males and, uh, and the females will find them. No, yeah. that's not the case. This, this, is, this, this technology would uh, prevent the mating uh, wherever we have this pheromone cloud uh, in the field. Uh, so it does not have an effect on attraction or bringing the the pest into the plants okay and should the mating disrupt installation be does it depend on the flying zone or the target pest or is it at a particular height that it needs to be at in the, yeah, the so, plant canopy or yeah it all depends on uh, it all depends on the cultural practices uh, for example where we have mechanization or intercultural practices uh, where uh, the farmers use uh, small tractors where we put the dispensers very close to the ground so it doesn't have an effect on the intercultivation practices. Oh, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, for, for example, we have seen that the dispenser technology will, uh, will be fine if it is even put at uh, two feet high. 
Okay, excellent. Um, what is the minimum field plot size to evaluate pheromone lure in the field? <laughs> That's a great question. So, <laughs> That's an anonymous person, so. <laughs> that, that, is an, that is a very good question and uh, it's a very important question as well. That's one big question that we're trying to answer in, uh, in, in, in Asia Pacific region where we have small land holding of the farmers. Um, but in areas where, uh, for example, in Indonesia, uh, farmers work as a, as a Kopoktan or Kalumpoktani. It's like farmers groups. Mm -hmm. So farmers groups, uh, farmers uh, uh, plant corn in communities. So it is important, it will be easy for us if there are some farmer groups, associations who actually do collective farming. Yep. So where the minimum plot size does not really matter at all. But uh, minimum plot size for this one would range anywhere between five to 10 hectares. Okay, excellent. Um, here's another question about the effectiveness of it. Um, but does the pheromone lure lose its effectiveness rapidly in hot weather? Okay, the first important thing is this is not a lure, it's a dispenser. And yeah. uh, the dispenser technology uh, compared to the lure, lure is um, just imagine you have an active ingredient in hexane and then the lures are dipped in or rubber septa, I would say, are dipped into the active ingredient and then they're placed uh, out in the, in the field in the traps. So it is pretty much exposed to most of the weather parameters. In the dispenser technology, the active ingredient is inside the dispenser. The dispenser is protecting it and releasing it through the season. Yep. So the effectiveness is season long. Okay. Uh, here's a question here. Now, thank you for your very nice presentation. It starts. And then its question is, I realize mating disruption and pheromones way of working is different from biopesticides or pesticides and efficacy is calculated differently. Still, should there be an average percentage efficacy against fall armyworm and how much would you perceive to be the efficacy range? Great point. Yeah, so it is different from biological insecticides. This is not an insecticide. Um, this is a mating disruption is a completely semiochemical management or sexual confusion. Um, so when it when we look at uh, the efficacy part coming from only from the mating disruption, uh, irrespective of insecticides or when we don't spray any insecticides or intervene, we have seen anywhere between forty to sixty percent effectiveness. Okay, excellent. There we, there we go. Good answer. Thank you very much. Um, uh, here's a question here, and I think then we might leave it because that's that's the end of our session. Um, but this question is based on your observation: How long does it take for the mating disruption strategies to show a decline in moth population in the field? We still have to see that for fall army worm as an invasive pest in Asia. But what we have seen uh, for um, stem borer populations is we have seen that at least uh, three seasons, three to four seasons, so back to back seasons, uh, um, you know, what we call as year round mating disruption. So if the same area is treated with mating disruption season after season, we see that uh, the number of generations coming down drastically. And also each generation is not that huge. So it, it will be easier for the farmers to manage it properly. Okay, great. Patty, thank you so much for the presentation and, and all those questions. And if you could go into the Q&A box afterwards and have a look, I think there's a few in the chat. If you've asked a question in the chat, please put it in the Q&A, just a reminder to everyone. But you could, um, if you could go in there, you can um, actually write some answers if you've got time, Patty, and that, that would be most um, appreciated. Uh, extremely good presentation. And just before you go, I wanted just to give the floor to Roma. Um, and I just, Roma, do you have any questions question that you would like to ask? She's on mute. Oh, she can't talk. And I may not have got her. No, I'm still muted. Says host is stopping me. I'm not stopping you, but let me see if I can ask to unmute. Does, does that work? Yes, thank oh you. Oh my goodness, there we go. I just, just, uh, <laughs> sorry, I've been sure Roma was having a heart attack. 45 at minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. perfect, just in time. But uh, sorry about that. But I was just going to ask you, did you have, because because I know today the, the that was an excellent presentation, um, lots of good information. And now we're moving on to this part two of the effective design of biopesticide trials. 
thinking about that case study that party just um, presented there was there anything specifically that you had to ask him that might be a nice entry into the next section or would you like to get started um no i've got nothing specific i like to to ask but um i'll just pick up on that and get started if that's all right that would be great thanks Roma, and thank you party thank you so much for the presentation very interesting and there's lots to unpick there for actually other sessions around pharma communications uh the regulatory side etc um a lot of things that we've heard before but it's it's great to hear it again Again, so thank you very much. Uh, and for all of those who asked questions, there's still 23 questions, and I think there's probably eight questions in the chat. Um, very popular topic. So uh, well done, and, and thank you very much. So Roma, you're welcome to start. Thank you, and, and thank you, Patty, for presentation. Your presentation. I think um, Patty's given us a very good example of working with a substance, um, a pheromone that's acting as a mating disruption and just exactly how different the trials have to be. You know, he highlighted that you're working on a landscape scale. He also highlighted that you're working in population management. You're not looking, not talking about pest kill. Um, and because of these characteristics, you have to have a very different trial design. And I think Apathy gave us a very good example of that. Um, so, what I'd like to do now, if my screen works, is move on to the next slide. I, I don't seem to have got control. Could somebody give me control back? Um, I, it seems to be. You've got some big problems today with the... It's not me. Who can start sharing? You should be able to have control right now. Um, let me see... Party, you don't have control by any chance, do you? No, I don't. Okay, I'm going to see if... I'm not sure why you don't have control, but let me have a look here uh, and... No, but I'm going to have to take over, I think, and find the... I can request, I'm going to request remote control. Okay, I've got it now. It's oh, working. have you? Well, it may yeah. go to me now. <laughs> Let me just, I think, I think it's fine. Oh, you've now. declined yeah, it. Excellent. Yeah. No, you've yeah. got it. All good. Lovely. All good, everyone. So no Great, one Roma. No one touch anything, please. And so we can <laughs> get it working. I think what's happening is if, if somebody else touches their screen, it takes it away. So great. Lovely. Um, okay, so if we're just thinking now about biopesticides, and I'm thinking primarily here about microorganisms and botanicals, a party's given us a really good explanation of, of what you need to do for pheromones. So if we just focus on those. So thinking what we know about biopesticides, we know that the lab laboratory to field transport for is very poor. Um, that what, what really you can do in the lab is you get a yes, no, you don't really get good enough quality data to make any other decisions than that. We also know that um, something I want to highlight is the reference treatment, your standard chemical that you have in your trials. Um, often for a biopesticide, they're not available because you, you, you're comparing um, against, you want to compare against another biopesticide um, to see, this is what I expect this biopesticide to do. How does my um, tests product compared to that but often we don't have already registered um, biopesticide that we can use for that and therefore what we're using is is a, a reference treatment that's a standard chemical and what I often see happen then is that somebody said oh it's not as good as the chemical and we think about the question that we're asking I didn't actually ask if it's as good as a chemical I asked what was happening if I put no treatment in what would happen so I think we need to think carefully about what the reference treatment is and and, and and how we use it. We also know from the previous session that dose um, finding is not simple, that we often don't know what our dose response curve is, and it's very difficult to find that out. We know that variance is high. Um, and as, as Party has pointed out, that the effect of a biopesticide may be long-term. It may be across a whole season. It may be across multiple years as well. Um, so again, this changes how we design trials and what we can do with trials. Um, and often applications of biopesticides, we tend to think of things as that standalone, but actually we want to use them within programs or a series or within an integrated pest management program. Again, that makes it complex for trials. 
and we'll go on and I need to think about application methods, water volume. And something we also need to think about is um, if you're working with something that's very new, the, often the regulations require you to have crop destruct. And this can end up being very, very expensive if you're working on a large scale. And you know, you can imagine if you're working with a mating disruption pheromone, you have to have crop destruct. It's not feasible, you economically can't do that. So what I want to do now is break down all the different steps of when you're looking at a trial and sort of in the, my aim in doing this is so that we can think about how we can reduce our variances um, and so that we, we stand a good chance of being able to have a result at the end of the trial that gives us an indication about how our product's working. So the first part we're doing is, okay, what's the test product that I have? And what we need to think about is saying, okay, what's the type of formulation? Why do we need to think about that? Because we need to think about how that formulation is going to go in the, in the spray tank. We need to think about that type of formulation um, in terms of how I expect my product to work. We need to think about the specification to targets. Um, you know, this project's, we're mainly thinking about fall army wound, but sometimes we're looking at, if we're looking at diseases, we may have an expectation that it'll affect two or three diseases at the same time. Or if you're looking at an aphid, will it affect several aphids or just one aphid? And what am I going to ca calculate? So you need to look quite closely at the label to understand that. And very importantly, we need to know what the mode of action is. So is this a contact acting product? Is it systemic? Is it repellent? Because this is critical to how you design your trial. You also need to know, um, is the product persistent? Um, we need a sort of repetition of the target. Um, we also need to know what crops we expect it to work on. And we need to look at the labels and say, well, are the conditions under which I shouldn't use it? For example, if it says this product is sensitive to UV, then I need to think about, well, should I be setting up my trial in the morning or the evening? And clearly if something's sensitive to UV and you can set up the trial in the evening, you, you have a window of time where you're not having such a strong effect with UV. And it's, Baculoviruses, um, in which there is a, a baculoviruses for fall armyworm, are particularly um, susceptible to being killed by um, UV so, and light. But other products have um, conditions that they require for a temperature um, and the, and humidity. So again, you need to pay attention to that. And then also have a look at what the application dose and delivery requirements. Now, I know what I'm saying is, is quite, sort of standard we should do this for every trial but what we what I know from working with microbials and botanicals is they're very unforgiving of making mistakes because they're not highly toxic because they're not highly systemic and highly persistent if you don't get it right it shows itself so this is what makes sometimes biopesticide trials a bit difficult is it shows how bad we're doing it are at doing trials sometimes so the first, the starting point I have, having worked, having looked at my product, having looked at what they expect the product to do, and what actually the label says, if there is a label. Um, the first thing I then do is think, okay, what is the question I'm actually asking for this trial? What am I trying to find out? Um, and it's surprisingly, we, we, we're taught this when we, when we first start to do trials, but sometimes we forget to do that and really think through is what's the question I, trying to answer with this trial, because unless we understand that, we can't design the trial well. Um, so are we asking, do we want to find out what the mode of action is? You know, do I want to find out what the dose response curve is? Because if I'm trying to find a dose response curve, I'm gonna need multiple different rates of my product um, to, to, to understand that. And how many different rates do I need? Do I need three, five, seven? How many, how many different doses do I need? I also need to understand, am I looking at the interaction of this product with the ecosystem? So am I looking at the effect of UV? Am I looking at the effect of humidity? Um, and again, you, you, you're gonna change your trial conditions if that's what you're asking it for. So perhaps you, if you've got a bacillar virus, you may be doing some treatments which are applied in the morning and some applied in the evening to say which one works better. Um, more complicated is how to use something in IPM program. That's really difficult to design trials with doing that. It's much easier to work out how something works as a standalone. We also might want to try and understand how it interacts with a chemical pesticide. Um, so if it's a microorganism, do I need to know whether certain chemical pesticides might actually kill or damage my microorganism? Um, or 
sometimes you've got something that you may have synergy with, with it, the chemistry. And so you actually want to think about how you use them together. You might not be able to tank mix, but maybe you can apply them in a, a particular spray sequence, which gets the benefit bit of both, both of the technologies. Um, also need to think about how long the, um, am I trying to find out how long the, the product persists once I've sprayed it? So for example, if, if it's um, a botanical and the botanical is highly volatile, how quickly does it volatilize? Does it volatilize in two hours? Does it volatilize in two days? And maybe you want to find that out. And sometimes you might be wanting to find out the effect of an adjuvant with, with your test product. Um, if I'm trying to find out how my new product is working, I always recommend don't put the adjuvant in because the adjuvant, we, we already know how adjuvants work. We already know that adjuvants will usually add to efficacy. So putting the adjuvant in puts a layer of complication that's not needed. So I'd always recommend for biopesticides, when you're trying to understand how they work online, don't put an adjuvant in. But you might separately be trying to say, is adjuvant A better than adjuvant B than C? And see the trial. And then the other question you might be asking is, what, what's the best way to apply this product? So we forget sometimes that we need to go through all of these elements and think really carefully about what's the actual question I'm asking. And the way I sometimes tr try and think about this is, what do I want my label to say? Do I want my label to say apply every seven days? And in which case, then I'm, I'm, my question I'm asking is, is what's the frequency of application? So I try and sort of think if I've got the bottle in my hand and I've got a label, what do I want that label to say? And then I go back and say, okay, how, I, how do I design a trial to get that, la that label information? So before I go for, further than this, are, are there any sort of burning questions that have come up that people would like me to um, address? Because we, this is a much more interactive session than last time. So really welcome your questions. Uh, not yet, I don't think, um, Roma, but I do see one here. Maybe it, it does relate actually. In order to minimize interference among amongst treatments or across treatments, what's the recommended separation distance between treatment plots? Now, this is probably to do with the last question, but um, I guess yeah. it goes back to your, your thing around what are you trying to achieve as well? Uh, making... yeah, actually, that's a really good question. And it is one that I'm going to address shortly. Great. So if I can hold that question. Because yes, that's you can. What... That's actually very important and quite critical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the first part. So once I've worked out what the product's doing, uh, well, what the product is, the next and what the question that I'm asking, the, the next part is how do I design my trial? Um, and I've said just a short while ago, and just to say again, when you're working with biopesticides, they're very unforgiving. If you don't do things well, they show up. You get a bad trial. So we think about a trial design. So the first thing we think about is, is the treatments, what treatments are put in. So it's good practice to have a control and you have your standard. Um, ideally a biological, but it, failing that, then it's gonna be a chemical. The entire purpose of, your, of, of that is to understand um, how the trial worked. Then if you're testing the product and the question you're asking is, does, will this product have an effect on my target pet? I recommend to put in three rates of the test product um, and you're using, you've got what you think is your label rate, then you do half your label rate and double your label rate. And what you're trying to see there is to understand how each of those um, rates work and to understand um, how the pest is responding um, and to also confirm that you're not putting more product out than you need. Um, if you've got a biopesticide that's, that has no um, adverse environmental or ecotox effects or no adverse human tox effects, you might be tempted to think, well, actually I can use it at, at a higher rate, but um, you've, you've got the cost of it. So you're sort of trying to say, well, what's the best amount I can use relative to the, to the, to the cost? So if I think about what we're using the treatments for. So control to see, we want to see that there's no effect. What would happen if I didn't treat this pest. The standard, because I want to see if the trial design was good. And then the different rates, as I've explained, is, is, is you're, you're looking to see if you could use less product and also to see possibly if you have dose response. Now I frequently see trials with more than five treatments in them. This becomes problematic when you have um, 
products with high variance because you've got too much, um, too many questions that have been asked. And usually what I find is none of them have been, been asked well. So I always recommend to sort of have a small tight trial design that asks just one question. Um, then you stand a chance of getting some good quality data out of it. So once I've worked out the treatments that I'm going to, I'm going to put into the trial, the next question is what's the timing of those treatments? Do I put something in before the pest arrives? Um, so um, again, semi chemicals are an example of this, um, or before the pest arrives in the sense that, because often we detect the pest or disease long after it's actually arrived. So sometimes you think, well, actually, should I try and put something out there before I think I can see the pest? Or you might have got predictive models where you're expecting the pest to arrive and think, should I have an application placed out before it arrives? Now, if you haven't got a persistent product, that's probably not a good approach to do. So they may have put it after the pest arrives, but when after the pest arrives, just after it arrives. And we see that in um, recommendations for trials is saying you should have 20% pest or disease. Now for most of the biopesticides, 20% pest or disease is way too high. Your population has established too well and it'd be, it's very hard for the um, botanical, the microorganism to keep up then because what happens is you're starting to move into rapid population growth expansion. And it's that classic sort of ec ecological thing is, you, is your control agent is tracking behind your pest population. And what we, we don't want that to happen. We want our control agent to be in front of the pest population. So that question about what after the pest arrives needs to be really thought about and also to think really well about um, what the pest population is doing, how fast it's, it's growing. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily about the size of the population, it's about how fast it's growing. You need to be, sort of think a little bit about that. So um, if we're looking at a, an application before the pest arrives, this is something if you're stimulating plant defense mechanisms, this could be a good strategy. So you switched on your plant defense mechanisms before the um, insect turns up and you're thinking, well, okay, so how long is that enduring? If that endures for five or six days, then I probably want to go in a few days in advance um, and apply it. Um, for, uh, the, after the pest arrives, this is really important for contact acting products because if you have something like an insect pathogen like a Bavaria and it needs to actually be on the insect, then you need the insect to be there and mo moving around to actually get a dose. Um, if you've got something like a bacular virus or a bacillus thuringiensis where you're waiting for the insect to eat it, you could, you can actually put the product out a little bit before the pest arrives because the insect will move around and eat it and consume it. But so this is where you have to know your mode of action to know the best strategy. Um, and sometimes you actually do want to put a product out when the population is growing fast. So if you think about something that's like a parasitic fungi where it needs the disease to be there so that it can actually um, germinate and grow. So again, this comes back down to understanding your mode of action well to understand what timing you should use. And then we have to think about the frequency of application. Now, in an ideal world, we'd put the product out every day because that's going to be the best chance for it to work. Um, but you know, we don't do that. Do we put it out every three days? Should we put it out at seven days or every month? What 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 should we be doing and why? Well, every day is just way too expensive and it's too much work and no one wants to have to do that. And I know everybody loves every seven days because it means you can set a nice project plan and you can go out every seven days and the same thing happens every Monday and you go out to your field and you spray. But actually, if the population is growing really fast, the insects don't know that you like working on a Monday, so the insects are just growing. Um, and so that maybe when your population is growing fast, you need to shorten your interval. So it might be thinking about that you have um, blocks, so say you have three applications at three day intervals, then if you can see that the population um, growth is reducing, then you can open out your intervals to every seven days or even every month. So again, this is where the frequency of application is not just depending on the mode of action of your substance, but also depends on what the, the insect is doing and where it is and what's happening to it. Um, something I just want to emphasize again is I don't recommend to 
be using an adjuvant unless you're specifically testing that they just sort of can confuse your results and leave you in a position where you've kind of asked two questions together and you've not been able to answer either question well because you are you don't really know how your product performed um with the adjuvant and i know sometimes people say well look at that treatment list well i could double that treatment list each of the test products could be with, with or without the adjuvant and yes, you could do that, but you then end up with a, uh, with a trial which has got eight, eight treatments. It's a big plot, it's harder to assess, it takes longer to, to treat. And what I find is when you have a big trial with lots of treatments, people are less good at making assessments, they're less good at making applications, and there's more probability of things not working well. So again, I, I recommend to keep it as a nice tight, um, trial with one question and just ask um have sort of around about five or six treatments okay so has there any burning questions come up Alison if we want to take yeah a there has there? been a few um and here's a here's a very simplistic question uh here H how big does the plot size have to be how do you how do you work that out as part of your trial design yeah um I'll, I'll come on to talk about that a little bit as well but okay. um this, no, I'll answer it here because um, that's, that's, that is a really good question. So what you see, that depends on, on the pest and it depends on the crop you're working on um, as well. So if you were working on something like an apple tree, um, your plot is, and you, you probably need sort of say five or 10 apple trees, your plots are gonna be really big. But if you're working on maize and you're sort of thinking, okay, how many plants do I need to be testing, I would never have less than 10 plants. Um, and you've got your guard rows, so you're probably looking at about 50 or 20, 20 plants that you want okay. to have in there. Um, so you, but you can do some mini plot work if you're asking a specific question. So okay. the plot size depends on your crop essentially. Okay, no, great, thank you. I've got two questions here. Now I'm gonna ask you both at the same time, both of them, and then you can decide which order you would like to, okay. to answer them. One is, could you please elaborate a bit on how to test adjuvant, adjuvants? And the next one is, this is a trial design for applying on leaf. What would the trial design considerations be for seed treatment products? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, dealing with the adjuvants first, if I was doing a trial for adjuvants, I would have one rate of, uh, of the product, the test product, and I would have it in combination with a series of different adjuvants. And I probably would only test three or four at any one time. So I'd have my control in there. I'd have my standard standard um, chemical with, the, with an adjuvant. And then I would also then have the test product um, with, two or three different adjuvants that I want to test. That's the way I do it. So you wouldn't have a variable product rate as well as an adjuvant. Okay. Um, and then for, yeah, I'm talking for seed treatment, for seed treatments then. So for seed treatments, um, you, again, you would be putting a different, if you're testing your test product and you want to know how efficacious it is, you would put a different concentration rate of, um, material onto the seed you stick it, you'd stick it onto the seed at a different rate to get the same effect so you're not you haven't got the more complicated application step but the principle of the trial would be the same okay here's a question here can we use i'm not sure there's a word missing but uh, maybe um are there challenges with using these products or testing these products and with temperatures more than 30 degrees in high temperature areas Really good question, yes, and I will come on to talking about that, actually. Yeah. Oh, excellent, thank you. Uh, and there's, uh, we'll come back to the high variance within and between treatments maybe later. Yeah. Uh, and I have another one here. Can we consider neighbouring plants as a factor in the trial and the application of biopesticides? Like, for example, nearby flowering plants, which is a habitat of parasitoids if the trial is pure botanicals or microorganisms? Uh, yes, you do need to think about the context in which you're working. I don't think you have so many concerns about um, the natural enemies in the surrounding area um, because what we'd expect is the natural enemies comes, uh, if you have a product that isn't affecting natural enemies, you'd expect the natural enemies to come across the whole trial. Um, and so what you're seeing would happening in your untreated um, would, would happen in your treated as well. Um, so it's, it's, 
a good question. It's something to ask yourselves. Um, but I think often you can sort of say, actually, it's not going to be a big influencer on the trial, but it's definitely something you should be thinking about. Okay. Okay, Roman, we've got lots of questions coming in. So what I propose is if we move on to the next section, um, mm -hmm. just so we keep in the, the time, um, okay. that would be great. Okay. So um, having worked out what um, what our product is, what our, what our treatments are, um, what the next question was saying, well, okay, how do I design this trial? So I'm, I've worked out this model on the basis of having um, a five treatment trial with six replicas. Now, this is where this is a really important point is I never work with less than six replicas for botanicals and microbials. Um, and I also noticed that Party also was talking about um, five or six replicas. And the reason for this is this is how you manage your variants. So I often hear people say, oh, I've got very variable data, so I'll do lots of trials. What you end up with is that scattergram I showed you earlier, is you just end up with lots of trials with high variance. You don't reduce your variance. So how do you reduce your variance? You reduce your variance by increasing your number of replicates. But there's a balance because if you have too many replicates, you can stand a chance of sort of hitting a hot spot and you get outliers. If you have too few, you're not accounting for all the variability. So you have to find a sort of sweet spot between the two. And in my experience, I've found that six replicates is about right. And I've done some work with a statistician um, on the probability of having outliers if you go more than this. So sometimes you can go up to eight and if you've got quite a nice homogeneous um, pest infestation, you could go up to eight. But if you're not confident of having a homogeneous pest infestation, you need to be careful. But I would never go below six because part of that is it's quite legitimate if you decide at the beginning of the trial um, that so if you and the reason you do a randomized block trial is you think I, I might have an effect of sun coming in from one side or rain coming in from one side or the influence of the hedge or the influence of the neighboring crop. So that's why you design a trial as a randomized block trial. Um, and so you're already saying, I expect it to be slightly different. Um, so what you're trying to do then is to have enough replicates and it, it does, I don't sort of say this is a good way to go, but what it does let you do is if, one of those blocks has something happen to it which is peculiar so for example if somebody left the irrigation pipe running in one of your lines of pots and it just got completely flooded you've got the possibility to remove one of the blocks and just do a statistical analysis on the remaining blocks and that's the whole point of us of having a randomized block design is that you understand those outside influences that you can't manage and then you can statistically allow for that in the design. Um, whereas if you've only got four and you have to knock one of the blocks out, you're down to just three and therefore you, and your variance is going to be massively high. So I really strongly recommend, and I've been using six replicates for about 15 years now and as a way to get more consistent trial results. And something we always do when we're looking about plot layout is we always revert to the randomized block design. And I'm just encourage you to be to think about that and saying, do you need to use randomized block design? Why are you choosing a randomized block design? Not just pick it off the shelf, really think about that. Um, so for example, why couldn't you use a completely randomized design? Do you expect there to be influences around the field where you're locating a trial that don't allow you to do a completely randomized design? Because that should be your starting point is a completely randomized design. You go to a randomized block when you don't think a completely randomized design can work. Um, so again, just encourage you to think about what layout you're using and why. And then a layout that I often use, and it's kind of my favorite, is I like the Latin square design. The problem with the Latin square design is you need to have as many treatments as replicates. Um, but one of the things that I do then is I still have my five treatments, but I double up my um, untreated. And that's another trick and another way in which you can get better statistical resolution between your treaties and your untreated is you have double the number of your untreated. Um, it's a way of helping to manage the variance and in, in the data when you're analyzing it. So you can see um, how much variability you've got because you've got a stronger data set for your untreated that you're comparing against. Um, and the nice thing about Latin squares you can see from, from this is that 
every treatment occurs in every row and in every um, column. And so that you know, they also then know that every treatment has always been surrounded by every other treatment that you're using. So you're managing the way in which things can influence each other. So I just, I wanted to explain it first and now I have sort of some quite so a, a little bit of a poll. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, just to touch that saying, somebody asked this, what happens if my product also stimulates untreated plots? This is, a, this is a problem. So what I discovered when I work in, worked with some botanicals a few years ago is the botanical, one of the things, its mode of action was it is directly killing the insect, but what it also do, does is stimulate plant defense mechanisms. And this isn't unsurprising that botanicals would do this because this is some of their role in, in their plants. And what I discovered was when I treated, my treated plots, were signaling, the plants were then stimulated by my product and then those plants signaled to my untreated plots and switched on the plant defense mechanisms in my untreated plots. And suddenly what happened is I didn't have a difference between my untreated and my treated. And it took me ages to work out what on earth was going on in the trials. And I solved it quite simply by putting up um, fleece between the trials to cut down the movement, the airflow of the, the volatile so to, to minimize the plant to plant um, communication. And that didn't completely get rid of, rid of it, but it really helped and it reduced it. So I started to then get the differences between my untreated and my, my treated. And I think then the other part I've already touched on is about what if my target is not evenly distributed? And I think you need to think about that and say, well, if it's not evenly distributed, can I change that? So can I artificially inoculate? Um, problem with artificial inoculation is one, you can sometimes have artificially high level of pest. The other problem you've got is you've then got a very synchronous population, whereas in, when we want to test the products, we may be wanting to test it against an asynchronous population to, to make sure that it's more, rep, more representative. Um, so it's, you have to sort of think through what is the, going to be the influence of, of all of the product on the crop and on the target and also how well my target is distributed. And the distribution of a target also helps you choose your trial design. So uh, I've spoken a little bit about plot layout and I just, I'm just curious as to what people have used. And so perhaps if you kind of put, uh, like to do this poll and just sort of say, what trial designs have you used and in your experience? Because we know a lot of the audience is very well experienced in doing trials. I've just put the poll on in progress, Roma. So hopefully yep. people can see that. We've got some, people voting now so just uh everyone you i think you have three three questions four questions there okay yep so you've got to scroll down to make sure you get the last question otherwise exactly. it doesn't let you submit <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is the technology is working now so this yeah, is yeah. this is a good uh, good ending um but we do it's 5 34 we are finishing at 5 45 so i'm just going to um raise that so i'm going to wait just maybe 10 more seconds uh and then i'm going to end the polling so quickly get your vote in if you haven't let's see if there's some last people oh quick i'm going to get over 50 percent Right, I'm going to end it now and I'm going to share results. You should see there. Can you see that, Roma? Yep, I can see it. And it's sort of what I expected um, is that we all tend to think about randomized block designs um, and maybe completely randomized, but we don't go, we don't mm. test ourselves with other designs. So I'd just encourage you to think about other designs um, and think why you've chosen the trial design that you chose. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> mm. Thanks. All right. Okay, good. So um, then the, the other part I want to think about is how we apply the product. Um, so we need to consider the water volume we're going to use, um, droplet size. So um, we need to think about the plant part that we're treating and we need to really think about what the sprayer we're using and the nozzle type. So something I know from doing some work with some microorganisms is if we reduce the water volume from a thousand liters to a hectare, Per hectare to 500 litres per hectare, we had a 37% increase in efficacy just by dropping the water volume. So I often see people are working at 1,000 litres per hectare. That's way too high. Um, it just 
way, way too high. But I, oh, I do see successful trials in crops where people are working down at 100 litres per hectare. So don't assume that you need a high volume of water for biopesticides. Um, so just think again about what could be a good water volume and to think about what you're trying to do. And one of my biggest frustrations is people saying we spray to run off. If you're spraying to run off, you're spray, you're, you're, the products will end up in the soil. You've just wasted it all. So there's no point doing that. So what you should be doing is spraying to before runoff. You shouldn't be having your droplets coalescing. You should be really thinking about it. So then think about your droplet size. Um, you know, we know already they're too large, they bounce off the leaves, they're too small, they may evaporate quickly. So why is this important for biopesticides? So if they're too large, you could have an accumulation of your microorganisms, for example, in those particles, and they disappear onto the soil. They never reach the target that you want them to. Um, if they're too small for a botanical, which is a highly volatile botanical, they can evaporate too quickly. Um, and so you need to find a sweet spot between particularly for microorganisms, where every droplet contains a microorganism. So you can't have the droplets too big because, um, and you can't have them too small because otherwise there won't be anything in them. So you need to think about that and find out what's the sweet spot to get the right number of particles in the droplet or for a botanical that you've got the right um, amount of water to slow down perhaps the rate of volatilization that they don't evaporate too quickly. And also some microorganisms need water around them to germinate. So you might actually want a slightly bigger droplet for those. But that doesn't mean you put on more water. It means you manage your droplet size. Um, need to think about the part of the plant that's it's treated. And we were asked, I was asked this question, you know, design your application equipment well for your foliar spray, whether you're doing the root irrigation, drench or in furrow, or whether you're treating your seed. Um, and something for microbials and that I really noticed as well is really think about what kind of spray you're using because one of the things I often see is people using a recirculation tank. They get really hot and as the water volume decreases, they get hotter and basically you'll kill your microorganisms potentially if you do that. So think, check what kind of um, tank you've got using. Um, just also think about what agitation you've got in there and how much um, it needs to be agitated and please use cold water. I so often see people um, taking water from the tap um, and they haven't let it run for a bit and it's the hose has been lying out and it's really hot. You could potentially just kill all your microorganisms. So big appeal here is calibrate application equipment properly for the botanical, the microbial. It's not the same calibration as it is for chemical, so that needs to be done well. Always use cold, clean water. You need to also pay attention to your pH because the pH is going to have a big influence on your microbials and your botanicals. And don't leave standing in the sun. One of my number of, when I was working for a company, the number of times I turned up on a grower site about somebody saying they've got problems, and what it turns out is the guy had been mixing the product, um, then went off for coffee and just let let it sitting in the sun. That's going to damage your your product as well. And please read the label about any precautions and any things that you should do. So really do, you've got to get have good sprayers, well calibrated, the right sprayer for the right technology, the right application technique and really pay attention to this. This is probably one of the biggest contributors to trials um, failing for, for botanicals and microbials. So based on the time, I'm gonna move on. So then the next part of that is sort of saying, so I've done my trial, I've, I've got my treatments, so I've, I've put them out, I've sprayed them really well. Now I'm waiting to see what happens. What do I do? Well, the one we always do is count dead and live insects. It's really easy, but that's not, um, not the only measure we should be thinking about. And particularly if you're working with something that has repellency, you're not gonna find your insects at all because they've all disappeared. They're not on your plots. So you think about how do you, how do you assess that? So one, you've had to think about careful trial design. The second part is how do you assess the fact that all your insects have disappeared off your plots? Um, also think about, um, we, we look at disease is, is or insect damage, and we look at what's the change in the insect damage. So instead of trying to count a live insect, measure the damage that's occurred by the, so you can, there's some really good charts um, about the percentage of leaf area that has been damaged. And you can do some really simple things. It's like take the leaves off the plots and just actually photocopy them. And there's some really nice software that will the, then calculate the, the damaged area that you could use. And so that can be quite a quick way to do it. Um, and also, what's complicated with these with microbials and botanicals as well is you trying to assess how your population development has changed 
um, and the rate of population. So how can you assess that? Um, and you also need to think that you probably need a higher frequency of assessment when you work with microbials and botanicals than you might do with chemicals because you're looking for much more subtle effects and much more subtle changes. Um, so the absence of a target is a good starting point, but it's not the only measure. Um, you may also want to look at improvements in plant health. Um, so some of these products which stimulate plant defense mechanisms, um, you can see better plant health. And when I've done some work on, on wheat, I can remember that my green leaf area on wheat was just atrocious. It was no green leaf area, um, but I had a much better yield on my, my treated plots. So you, you need to be thinking about what is your assess? What does my pest do? What does my product do? And so what is the best thing to assess for, for to get a measure of what it's been doing? Okay, I'm just going to move on a bit now um, and start to sort of wind up. So I, I want to sort of summarize now here and sort of saying, so when you're working with microbials and botanicals, what you're actually doing is you're, you're not trying to kill pests or disease, you're trying to manage the population. Um, and because of that, it's much more complicated. We have to think about the biological characteristics of the product. We have to think about the relationship between the dose and effect, and we need to understand the mode of action. And some of the things I try and think about when I'm about how to get good efficacy is as scientists, we always tend to think about what, how, what's the best the product can do. But actually a farmer is probably more interested in when a product's not working. So maybe we should design the trials to say, does this product not work when I only use at a, at a very low rate or does it not work when I um, apply it in the mornings or something like that and so again this comes into the beginning of when you're thinking about trial design is sort of thinking about not how to make it work best but how do I understand when it doesn't work because we can't because we have high variance and because we can't manage what farmers will do we can't manage that he gets the best, but we can manage that he can um, not do things. We can give recommendations as don't do this, or it doesn't work when you do this. So sometimes you need to think about efficacy back to front a little bit. Make sure you've got appropriate trial design. Really please keep the number of replicates higher. Think carefully about your timing of application relative to pest and disease. Think carefully about the frequency and not just go what because it's easier to go every Monday morning and just think of what the pet pest's doing. Think about what effect you're trying to do, you're going to assess, and really think about how your application strategies. So I was going to pause there, Alison, and stop um, so that we could have a good discussion. You know, that's great. And thank you, Roma. I always think you're a bit like a magician, really, because you've. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I can rely on you to always keep it to the time schedule and it's actually right on 5.44 in my timing. So um, that really sort of brings it to the end, but now we're gonna have a question and, and answer time. For those people who wish to stay on, I know it'll be a bit longer, um, but we'll have a very informal question time like we did last time. And and so so please stay on for a bit longer if you would like. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's gonna be very interesting and I've got lots of questions here, Roma, for you. Um, mm -hmm. And what I might do is I might just um, tie it up and then we'll, like I did last time um, and and just sort of finish it for those people that do need to go and then we'll have that question time again, if that's okay with you. If you could just move to the next slide and the next one and the next one and the next one. I'm just going to say thank you very much to both our speakers uh, today. It was absolutely fantastic. And we're going to have questions now for Roma, um, which was just a, a really quite in-depth um, discussion and presentation there that, that she shared with us. But please join us on the community uh, at the forum. It's actually, there's a circle around the blog there. You can visit that too. And Roma is actually featured in one of those blogs uh, from her session last time. And also, I'm just going to remind you that our session, we'll be carrying on with a series in two weeks time and there'll be a session there on conservation biocontrol. So if we just go back um, two slides, Roma, and we'll go back to questions and I just, or maybe even your finishing slide was a good place, I think, um, to end with. I just want to thank everyone for joining us and thank the two speakers. And if you'd like to stay uh, for now for questions, you're most welcome to. Um, and take care for those who are leaving. So, Roma, questions for you. And there's quite a lot up here, and I'm not surprised. Um, what okay. some very good tips. Uh, here, let's start from the bottom. What should be the border size or buffer between treatment plots? 
Yeah, this this depends on your product, is uh, it what you expect me to say. So if you've got something like a botanical that has got um, is highly vo volatile, you want to think carefully about having um, either crop barriers or other barriers between your plots. Um, and then for the outside of the trial area, um, I usually have at least one row of the crop around it. It's not always feasible depending on the crop you're working on, but it, it, that's the ideal because that helps to um, mean, helps to make sure that each plot had the same humidity and agronomic conditions. And also simple things is, is people bump into your trials. People look, that's one of the, biggest reasons I lose trials is people walk over them, bump into particularly the farmers. So it's quite nice to have an extra border around it and that you clearly mark it up. Um, and I was taught to have the same border around every plot, but sometimes I know that's not feasible because of the size and space you're working with. Um, so ideally uh, a row of crop all the way around and between plots. Um, but if you can't do that, what I try to do then is, is that I only sample from in the middle of the plot area. So you've effectively created guards by taking your samples within the, the middle part of your plots. Okay. And I guess it's the same. I mean, how much minimum distance should be kept in between treatments during designing the trail light, light, trial sorry, <laughs> layout with any biopesticides to avoid any cross impact between the treatments? That was another yeah. question. Yeah, so same thing, you, you should have guards around them. Um, and again, it, it, the, the number of guards you have, whether it's a double or a single row of guards, depends on the product. So, And it also depends, depends on how good your spraying is as well, because what you're trying to stop is you're trying to stop your spray moving into the plots um, and you're trying to stop um, other move, move. So if you put a seed treatment, clearly it's less important to, than if you've got a foliar spray um, but yeah you should have you should have guards around all your plots if you if you possibly can do it because it's very rare that someone who manages to stop right at the end of their plot so just make sure you've got a bit of space I don't like it when there's big walking spaces between plots you must have sufficient walking space between the plots so you're not walking across your plots but I don't like when it's too big because then effectively each plot becomes isolated whereas what you're trying to do is re uh, reproduce what's happening in the field where the crops are closer together so you just have to find that delicate balance that you've got enough space to walk and not damage your plots but not so much that each plot is then completely isolated from around that's it. a very good point um here was one that was at the start very often the major problem is high variance within and between treatments especially for the pest density what is the best way to solve it replicates yeah. So no, it's, it's be good, at, be clear about the question you ask, keep your treatments as low as possible and uh, apply your products really well. And then it's, it's replicates is we, we can't get rid of the variants. What we can do is design trials that manage that and allow us to read the data from it. That's what we're trying to do, but we can't completely change the variables. We can make sure everything's applied as well as possible it will always be variable. You will always have 40% variability. So replicates. And if you really think you've got something with a high variance, double your controls so that you can show the difference between your untreated and your treated. Great tips, Rama. Um, a question here from Wilma. What should be done just in case you are not able to finish applying the treatments because of rain? So other treatments will be washed out while others have no treatment at all. Uh, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have been treating your trial at all if you thought it was going to rain. That's the answer to that. You, 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 if, if, if it's going to rain, don't apply your treatments. It's, it's the wrong time to apply. OK, good answer. Very clear. And, and I think we did we answer this question, I think, about the what happens with these temperatures, these very high temperatures? Um, we didn't answer that one. So um, what was the question? Yeah. Yeah. So that was asked, wasn't it? What happens at high, at very high temperatures? Yeah. Again, you need to look, understand the product, understand what the limitations of the product are, whether it is influenced by temperature. But for the botanicals, which are highly volatile, um, I would tend to recommend that you apply those late in the evening um, so that you, you've got time for the product to work. Um, whereas if, if it hits really high temperatures, what tends to happen is the droplets dry out very quickly and the product volatilizes before you can have your effect. Mm. So think about 
changing when you make your application to balance it with the weather conditions. Okay, here's a good question here. Should yield be an important parameter in biopesticide trials or all pe pesticide trials for that matter, considering that yield is a function of many factors? Yeah, um, that's, that's a, it's a very good question, a very tricky question, because we often know that we've got products that we, we consider working and sell and farmers like them because they kill insects, but actually it doesn't make a difference on yield or we can't detect the difference. So I think the answer to that is it depends um, on the product you're using and it depends on what you're trying to do as to whether yield is useful. So if you have products which stimulate plant defense mechanisms, that's probably a situation where yield is probably gonna be more useful to assess than other situations. So again, it's just thinking about what the product is, what it does, and what is the question I'm trying to answer by assessing yield. Um, something I, I do see though is not just yield, is quality. So you can see quite often some products, um, if I'm thinking about potatoes, if I've used a, a microorganism to treat potatoes, um, what I can see sometimes is that I'm not seeing a significantly different level of disease, but what I can see is I have more marketable crop yeah. um, and because you, you get some effect, which means that you've got all the potatoes the same size, which is sells better, you get more money for that. Oh, that's very so, really important though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Farmer, it's it's incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a question here, from, uh, and it's how to minimise spray drift effects. Yeah, right. Yeah, so just just going back to the last one, saying so. Yep. It, what I was going to say was, its uh, marketability is perhaps more important than yield. To emphasise, um, how can you sp spray drift effects? Uh, don't spray when it's windy. Is one of the things. So that's not the right spray conditions. So make sure you're using the right spray conditions. Think about your droplet size. Have you got too fine a droplet, and so that it's prone to drifting? Um, look at your height above your crop as well that you're spraying, um, and um, yeah, and and your yeah, you just think about what nozzles you're using and the spray droplet size you're, you're using. Um, and the main problem with the spray drift is, is that you're losing product off your treated area um, as much yeah. as anything. So you're not treating, getting the treatment to where you think you are. Okay, a couple more questions, two more questions perhaps, and then, and then we might wind up, but there, there is lots here. I see Peter has definitely, Chinwara has definitely got lots of good questions here. He must be working in this area. Um, in biopesticide trials where there is no ideal reference product, should the decision on target product effectiveness be dependent on performance relative to untreated control or a chemical product used in place of a true standard? It should all, when you're using the biopesticide, it is always, and it's true for anything actually, it's comparison to if I didn't treat. I'm not asking the question, did my product work as well as the chemical? I'm asking the question, how does this product perform compared to not treating? The only reason I have a chemical standard or any standard in my trial is to prove that my trial design worked. So what I expect is my standard would give me the level of efficacy as I know and expect it should do. I'm not interested in what it does relative to my test product. That's not the question. So the question should always be, how did my product perform compared to untreated? Okay, excellent. Um, here's maybe two more questions. Uh, <laughs> so many. But what is the effect of naturally occurring pathogens on efficacy trials of microbiome biopesticides? Is it something to consider? In, some, in such cases, mortality in control and increased mortality in treated plots. I'm not quite sure I, it, that doesn't quite make sense, but I think you understand it. Is it something to consider? Yeah, and I think we've talked talked about that. So saying that um, you're not working in, the, in a sterile crop. There's other pests and diseases in there that are going to be interacting with what you're doing. So yes, you, need, you do need to think about them. So if I was doing um, um, assessments, I don't just assess for the insect that I'm looking for or the disease. I'm looking at what else is there. So that's other natural enemies coming in, in there because again, natural enemies could influence your effects, but I'm also looking at what other diseases there. So you should do a full inventory, it, not necessarily in the same detail as you're doing for your target, but you should have an assessment of what's going on in the crop for the other pathogens and other, other natural enemies. And they okay. may or may not have an influence, but you should still have a good idea of what's there. Okay, I've got one more one more question. I think that'll bring us to the hour. But it is: What is your opinion on application of microbiome products during night 
Is it more effective compared during the day? And have you heard about this? Yeah, I have heard about it. And I, I just do wonder how you managed to work in the dark. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I think it, that, that sometimes it's a misinterpretation of what people are trying to do. So it could be because the humidities are higher, but I sort of think you should apply in the, in the light. And that if you make an application, but make it late, late evening before it gets completely dark and you'll have good humidity. It's the same for UV. You're going to get less exposure from the UV, but you have to also balance that against if your insect's not active at night either and you're looking to have quite a quick effect it, you're not going to get the effect that you think you should have during the night time as well so yep. yeah you need just need to think it through okay so thank you so much um for this whole session roma uh, and party like uh, i'd have to say it would be great to actually be physically in a location actually talking about this and workshopping it and actually going out in the field and i think that's something that actually all of us in the region would enjoy so maybe that's something we can look forward to next year uh we'll we'll see we'll, we'll cross our fingers there um because that, that would be really great to talk about this uh in person i think and we could talk about it for many hours and this was just a really a, a, an amazing session lots of useful uh, tips uh, it's great to hear and have shared the experience of ProVivi in the field um, all those um, good ideas and and really just from your experience Roma to share that it's it's very valuable to, to everyone working here and, and you can see the positive feedback that we've had uh, it's it's absolutely brilliant and I've just got one more poll actually um, for everyone if you're still here but I would like to say thank you again and I'd also like to say take care everyone and we'll see you back at our next uh, session. Um, Party, thank you very much for your help and for, for answering all those questions. Um, I can see you've been very busy in the background and thank you again Roma and no problems about the few little problems we had it is actually an extremely good event and sometimes those things happen we all know that. Um, but fantastic information shared. So thank you very much, everyone. If you could answer the survey, uh, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Buzzy. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, Roma. For giving us a chance to do this. Yeah. Oh, no, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So thank you. I'll just give people a bit of a chance to, to answer it. So do, we, do we get immediate feedback? <laughs> I've given you immediate feedback. You're absolutely amazing. <laughs> Both of you, it's really great. Uh, no, and it, it, fantastic to share that information. I think uh, we've got someone that's doing their doctorate, I think, or master's in there, and they were just saying that they're going to use lots of these tips to think about in their design trials. So you can't ask for better than that. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm going to close the session now. So take care, everyone. Great day. And I will see you later. Goodbye. Bye.